Glad to be here. My name is Glenn Valcox. I'm one of the safety consultants that work for workers' compensation class. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I got this job today of doing this the same time, the same way that I got my first job in safety. I was the only one to apply. So, uh, Doug, Doug Love who coordinates a lot of the use of accounts uh, for us in the safety department as for volunteers and no, nobody else wanted to do it. Um, but I'm happy to be here. I like talking about safety. I uh, Before I came to the fund, I worked for a, uh, a major university here in, in Utah and uh, I was on the elevator with the athletic director and he said, oh, you're from the Department of Prevention of Fun. And that, that's not what the way that I view safety. Safety is fun because the opposite of safety is injuries. And injuries definitely aren't fun. So um, I want to, uh, as, as we go throughout this, I, I like to keep things casual. If you have any questions, you don't need to wait till the end. Feel free to ask those. I, I like to lighten things up with a few pictures, video clips, um, and animal safety. So a lot of unpredictable things can happen. And uh, animals, bears, rodeos, they're, they're not always predictable. Now one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going <coughs> to beat you to death with OSHA. I, I don't believe in, some of you may have seen the OSHA cowboy, this is the OSHA bull rider, okay, <laughs> if conforming to OSHA uh, specifications, the three point seat belt, the ejection seat, shoulder pads, uh, airbag, a padded dash, nerf horns, to cover up the horns. That's not what we're going to talk about today. There's actually not a lot of OSHA regulations that directly apply to fair rodeos, animal handling specifically, but there are a lot of regulations. We'll, we'll talk about a few of them, the main ones that, that do apply. What I'd like to talk about today is not just animals, but animals are, are the main ones. Animals and animal handling. Um, equipment. There's always equipment, heavy equipment, vehicles that go along with that, and then we have the, the public exposure. It was interesting to me just listening to uh, Johnny's uh, presentation, he, he talked a lot about that and liability. A lot of that's for the, the, the public. Mine, a lot of it is, is kind of focused towards the worker or the volunteer who, as we heard, is covered as an employee for at least the medical portion of that. So I, uh, I look back through my video clips, um, animal handling, handling animals. And I came across this just two days ago, and I, I wanted to show it how um, unpredictability, okay, of animals. Go back two slides. Okay. And this one, do we have the audio? reintroducing it to, to the wild when, that, when this happened. So um, animals are unpredictable. <clears throat> Working with animals. I had this slide. I, I have light green to many of you know. I said, Blake, look over my PowerPoint presentation. And he said, um, you had, Blake, you had animals are often unpredictable. Take out the often. They are un unpredictable, as you well know. Even, even you know, those animals that we work a lot with. They are often much larger 
more powerful than we are. Depending on the animal, they may bite, kick, buck, run into, trample, step on, roar, charge, and I probably left something out there that did do well. Workers, volunteers, or the public may not realize the hazard. Now usually, those people who, who work with the animals, you know, whether it's the rodeo, or they're working the chutes, um, getting the animals in and out, so usually they're pretty good. They, they do realize the hazard, hazard oftentimes. Volunteers, to a lesser extent, but a lot of times you'll you'll find at your at your fairs the public they do not recognize that hazard. Hey, there's a pretty pig or horse. Or let's go and pet. You know, little kids want to pet everything. So keep keep that in mind. And also with your volunteers, your short-term employees who you have, they don't always realize the hazard that they have. that too if they're putting a lot of <laughs> Working with equipment and vehicles. And by equipment, I, I guess I mean everything that's not a, a vehicle, a car or a truck. You know, it might be power tools. It might be the animal handling equipment, the chutes, the fencing <clears throat> that you have uh, to get them into the rodeo or into their pens. The workers or volunteers may not be familiar with that equipment, even though they, they may not tell you that. Oh yeah, I've, I've done this. Yeah, I, I've been to several rodeos. Yeah, I, I, know, I know what I'm doing. Uh, oftentimes they're not familiar with that. Often the work leading up to and during the event, the fair, the rodeo, the horse show, oftentimes those happen under very strict time constraints. How many of you work directly with the fair when it, when it comes, okay? So how many of you who raised your hands during that two weeks leading up to the fair through the last day, how many of you work an eight-hour day? Nobody? What, uh, one person? Oh, okay. How many of you work eight hours or less? Okay. Is that a good time to, to take your family vacation? No, you're under some serious time constraints during that. Everything is rush, 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 and then you're like, ah, it's over. We got through another another year. Um, because of those time constraints, sometimes we take shortcuts. Sometimes those shortcuts that we take can lead to a hazardous situation or an injury. The other thing that we have typically at fairs and rodeos, we have mobile vehicles that are often working in close quarters and in close contact with each other and the public and, and the employees. Trucks, cars, ATVs, heavy equipment, you've got things going on during that initial build up and then while the event is going on. Cars and, and vehicles can be dangerous too. <laughs> I like that one because he runs back just like, oh, I don't want to yell me. Oh, well, I don't want my whistle. When we talk about preventing injuries, and, and you know, even though we don't insure the public, we still want them to be safe as well. And that, those are a primary concern as well as your employees for, for the counties. There are basically three main ways that we can, in, in safety and in risk management, that we can eliminate, reduce, prevent injuries. And those are engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. I'm gonna talk about those as we go through the different types of hazards that we have, and, and kind of the control hierarchy. What's, what's the best out of those three methods? What, what would be the best? And maybe we ought to define a little, give me an example of an engineering control. Don't have the event. Okay, that would be substitution, and, and we, we do that. Um, if, if we have something that is really hazardous, we can choose not to have that activity, right? Well, well what's an example of a an engineering control? Like a safety shield. Okay, Safe, safety shield or a, or a guard on a piece of e equipment. Uh, that would be an example of an engineering control. Administrative control. 
What's an administrative control? A policy. Policies or training. Okay, training is, is huge. And not that training isn't good. The best way is to eliminate the hazard. If we can design that so there isn't a, a hazard there, that's the best way. But if there's still a hazard, we want to train people. We want to have policies and procedures that they follow to reduce the effects of that hazard. And third and last is personal protective equipment. Why, why does that take last place? Because it doesn't eliminate the risk. It doesn't eliminate the risk. All it does is put a barrier between the hazard and the, and the person. If that barrier fails, which sometimes they do, the person is exposed. So go ahead, Ken, you got the new motorcycle. Wear your helmet. We know you're going to crash, but well, you wear your helmet and go as fast as you want. You know, you'd never do that without some, some training first or making sure that the equipment, making sure that the vehicle is safe. So engineering controls, when I think about those for fairs, rodeos, other animal events, using the right equipment for the job. What, what do we mean by that, using the right equipment? Well, if you were going to use some kind of a prod on an animal, you'd use an animal prod, not a taser. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, how, how many of you have worked with pigs at the fair before? I, I tried to find an example of this. So we did, we did pigs a few years ago. And how do you hold a pig while you are trying to trim its ears? And you know, you have to trim it, its ears. They, they like it sometimes it so it can show its nice fat rump. And, the pork chops and, and that kind of thing. So how, how's the best way to hold the pig? It is, by, by the hog noose. And, and people were telling us, we tried to grab it by the leg and that pig has a lot of power. That wasn't working out, we'll just get you a hog noose. So, so you have a noose, okay? And it, basically it's a noose, you put it around their snout, they come up and sniff it, take its food or something. You catch them in that and they stand still. They stand still and there's not much they can do about it. That's the equipment that's specifically designed for that operation. So we use what is designed for that, the right equipment. We don't use a taser, okay, or, or something that we shouldn't be, be using. Use the right equipment for the job. Animal handling equipment should be designed for the job and for the animal. You know, if it's just a fence or a gate or a pen to hold the sheep or the pigs, it's probably not going to do too well to hold the bulls in, in with that. It needs to be designed for that. Designing the, the gates, the fencing, the chutes, the pens to minimize public contact, especially for those, you know, maybe not as much the sheep, but for those larger and maybe more, more dangerous animals. Um, using the right prods, restrained equipment, a hog <coughs> noose, or, or whatever other animal handling equipment we have. Don't forget about the, the public exposure animals. Because most members of the public, they see that draft horse just as a pretty horse that likes to be petted. You know, not as something that one foot on their, on their foot is going to cause several broken bones. Engineering controls for mobile equipment, tractors. Trucks, ATVs, heavy equipment, hand and, hand and power tools, electrical cords and equipment. And I see this a lot at <coughs> where you have a temporary buildup for an event. It's like, well, we need power over here. Well, we need it over here. Let's just take an electrical cord and we'll put it into a power strip. And oh, now we've used up all six outlets. So what do we what do we do? Let's get another outlet power strip and plug into that. And let's get another one and, you know, you can't do that. You can't just put power wherever you need it. If you have electrical cords, according to OSHA, those are temporary use only. Quick, like, like build up to a fair, that, that's okay. But keep them out of the walkways as much as you can. Don't cut holes in sheetrock to put them in or, or in a building. And you can't just run those, you know, in and out of doors where they create a greater hazard. 
Make sure all of your electrical equipment is approved. Is approved, is in good condition. Ladders. We see quite a few ladders <coughs> during the, the build up to fairs uh, and that type of thing. Make sure that you have good quality ladders, let people use them appropriately. And I'll talk about training in a minute. Defective equipment should not be used. Keep the guards and safety devices in place. If it comes with a guard on that leaf blower, on that lawnmower, whatever it is, keep those in place. Okay? Using the right equipment for the job. Okay? This came under the caption, I should have bought a truck. Okay? That's not using the right equipment for the job. And these two are probably in the same carpool or caravan. I don't know. They must have. Maybe you've got the kid in the front car and dad in the, the second car holding it on there. Not the right equipment for the job. Administrative controls. Who needs to be trained? Everyone. Everyone. What do we train on? Specific to the job. What are the hazards of the job? And what can I do to protect myself from those hazards? Now first, probably all new employees, whether they are a short-term employee or a season or a long-term employee, probably goes through that general training. General training should include, first thing that it should include is this county, your county is supportive of safety. We value safety. We don't want you to get hurt at work. Put that statement in your training, your new hire training. Put that in your policy. First page, we are supportive of safety. <coughs> your discipline policy, your drug policy. Who to report hazards to? If I see a hazard, I see something that's unsafe, I see people being unsafe, I see the public being unsafe, what do I do about it? And boys, don't always come, don't always know, you know, or, or come with that knowledge, hey, I need to report this unsafe condition to my supervisor, to <coughs> the manager. You need to tell them who, who they report that to. What to do if injured. Okay. By injured, do we just mean a big injury with blood spurting out? No, we mean anything. Everything needs to be reported. Not that we need to file a claim for it, but everything needs to be reported. Any general safety procedures that you have. Then, and, and there also may be some OSHA required training. Don't forget about that. Hazard communication, if they work with chemicals, they need to be trained. They need to have that hazard communication training. That may be, their, their only exposure to that may be the two weeks before the fair, they're spray painting the pants green. Or they're, they're painting uh, a display somewhere in the craft shop. But that is the hazard communication standard. <coughs> Every year OSHA puts out a list of their citations who they cited, and they, they call it the top citations. You can look at the top 10, you can look at the top 50. Year after year after year, the hazard communication standard is, cited, is always in the top five. Always, in the last 10 years. Forklifts, you have people loading and unloading forklifts or other mobile equipment. Cranes, scissor lifts, loaders, all of those need training. If there weren't any PPE, personal protective equipment, they need training. Does your, who, who would need bloodborne pathogens training? Law enforcement. Law enforcement or? EMS. EMS. Anybody who is going to be responding where there's a potential bloodborne contact, rendering first aid, that type of thing, needs to be uh, trained on bloodborne pathogens. Your procedures, where are the blood? cleanup kits specific to, uh, to their work environment. Ladder safety. How many of you use ladders before the fair? You mean I've got to train my volunteers and my employees on how to safely get on a ladder? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. You do need to have it. Include that in that kickoff safety meeting. Here are the ladder safety rules. You know, they need to extend three feet above the top of the building. 
We, they need to be put on a secure surface. We don't use defective ladders at the right angle. They need to be tied off at, at the top. Then there's that specific safety training you give them. What are the hazards of the job and what do I do to protect myself? A pre-job safety meeting is good. A, a kickoff safety meeting, or if you do something un, unusual like pre-task safety meeting. Just, hey, we haven't done this before, we're going to have a safety meeting on it. Who is authorized to operate your equipment? Do you have a list? Do you have a list of who is <coughs> authorized to operate the backhoe, the tractors, the front end loader? We should have a list of those who have been not only trained, and, and you would hope that they'd be experienced as well, but are they authorized? And, and don't just assume that, well, you know, so-and-so came to us from, they worked at this place, or they worked on a farm. Therefore, we know they'll be able to use all this equipment, the tractors and that. Make sure that you have documented training and the authorization for your heavy equipment and your and your vehicles. Okay, so that people don't do things that are stupid, like step out of the bucket when they're working at heights. One thing that's good to have, especially for those hazards that you view as your most hazardous, and you say, okay, what's the most hazardous thing that we have at our fair? What's the most hazardous thing that we have from for our employees? Job safety analysis for those tasks that you do, you know, maybe it's every year. These are really a great idea. And I don't know, how many of you have a job hazard analysis in some of your departments? Maybe it's public works or somewhere. You break down the job, <coughs> the individual steps, list the hazards and the specific procedures to be followed. The hazard control procedures for these hazardous tasks need to be followed, not just when they feel like it, not just when it's convenient, but 100% of the time, especially for those we call them life-saving rules, okay? ATV safety. Do we ride with our helmets? Do we ride safely all the time? Or is it okay sometimes to allow someone to ride on the back or allow someone who's not trained and authorized to ride on those? So. Um, a ATVs. One of our, uh, when the Olympics uh, came here in 2002, it's hard to believe it's been 13 years, but Workers' Compensation Fund, we wrote the coverage <coughs> for the workers, the employees of SWAT, and also the volunteers. And each of the uh, safety representatives were asked to volunteer for the different venues and I uh, volunteered and I was sent to the metal club that was the, the uh, venue that I was on uh, ended up being a great experience and uh, we had a few broken bones we had some electrical shock um, our broken bones were from surfing during uh, body surfing during the concerts and, and they were to the public. They were not to, um, we did have one employee with a broken bone, but uh, it, it was a really neat experience. One of our worst injuries was a four-wheeler, an ATV, and this was at a different venue, but the employee, we had a lot of uh, foreign citizens who, who came and, and volunteered to work the, uh, the Salt Lake Olympics as, as volunteer. And in one of the venues, they needed some stuff moved, and so they told uh, this girl, and I can't even remember the country she was from, they said, get on the four-wheeler and go and take this stuff down. You know, well, I think it was one of the ski resorts. And they said, take these supplies down there, because it was a couple hundred yards, and didn't want to make a walk. And so they, the assumption was, everybody knows how to drive a four-wheeler, right? And, and the four-wheeler was already running. And so she got on, gave it the gas, didn't know where the brakes were, and instead of braking, she gave it more gas, and she ended up flipping it and broke her, her collarbone. And, you know, the assumption was incorrect. Everybody knows how to ride a four-wheeler. Everybody knows how to safely 
right before we were right. This is Utah. Everybody has it. They're either their own or a cousin or you know somebody has those. Don't don't assume that. Other administrative controls. Put up barriers, fencing, signage to limit access when necessary. What areas do you want to restrict to the public? Or, or do you want to respect not to the public? What areas do you not want the public going? What areas are off limits? What areas are an attractive nuisance to little kids? Okay. So certainly the animal, you know, when you've got the, the rodeo, the, the horses and the, the bucking bulls and all that, you want, you want that off limits. <coughs> You know, one thing, um, uh, Charlene and, and Dave are here with, with Davis County. One area that we determined during our, our walkthrough was, what about underneath the bleachers? Yeah. Is, can that cause an accident? I, I know of several injuries, not necessarily employees, but several injuries. What happens when kids go under there and play? Yeah. Running into things, head injuries, yeah. stitches. Uh, things being dropped down on their heads. And, and so that area is the last time we did our walkthrough, they had uh, signs and fencing saying, do not enter. Um, because what happens, and not, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but uh, what happens if you have signs, if you have no signs up with your liability and a kid goes under the bleachers or somewhere else and gets injured? What is your obligation? Well, you're, you're liable. What do they become if they crawl through the fence or crawl under the fence? And what do they become then? Still a lot less. Uh, but they become, and, and my only knowledge is when I was studying for the, uh, the ARM exam, they become a trespasser. And the liability is not the same. You have less liability for a trespasser than you do for someone who you haven't worn. And you're also, for an attractive nuisance, and I, I'm just using underneath the bleachers as an example, because when the event gets slow, that's where kids like to hang out. So just be aware of that, the areas that need to be restricted. Those who are driving, do you check, make sure they have a driver's license? Do you check their MVRs? If they're, and that would probably apply you know, to those who are gonna be driving off-site and in, in your county vehicles, do you check the MVRs? For some things, it's really good to use that buddy system. You know, it might be, uh, it's easier for the animals and, and moving the animals around. If you have two people, certainly, than, than just one. And that's not the only time, you know, if they're working at night, uh, probably good to have the buddy system. Just someone there, a coworker, co-volunteer, who can uh, help out and watch out. It also is good when we talk about uh, manual lift, lifting and moving materials around, team lifting. Uh, don't need to say any more about this because uh, Johnny all, already covered this, but obtain certificates of insurance for all subcontractors, okay? Using the right equipment for the job. I don't know what that is. Um, maybe it's meant to protect for birds. That might, maybe it's just a way to get that great home. I don't know. But, but using the right equipment for the job, and the right, the right PPP, and the right clothing, okay? What is proper work clothing when you have this construction, remodeling, displays being set up and that? What is proper attire to come to work in? Shoes. What about flip-flops? Okay. What else do you want to avoid? And, and you want to cover this in your volunteer training meeting in your new hire training. What else do you want to want to tell them? How about shorts? Are shorts allowed? I don't know. Maybe it depends on the, on the task. If you're working around animals, if you're working around gates, lifting heavy things, things sharp metal, you probably don't want to have them in, in shorts. What PPE is necessary? When would safety glasses be required? What, what does OSHA say about uh, when safety glasses are required? 
What any is there any power tool that doesn't require them to use safety glasses? I haven't found one yet. Anybody bought a hammer lately? Anybody bought a hammer? It's got a sticker right on it. It says wear safety glasses. So even a lot of hand tools. What about helmets? <clears throat> when would you use those? Do you require, how many of you have ATVs that you use buzzing around to your employees? Do you require helmets? Yeah. What about for youth? I think it's, a, isn't it the law? Is, and you, I think under 18, I think you have to wear a helmet. I'm not, I'm not sure on that, but I think that you have to have a helmet on. Um, do you see helmets at the, at the rodeo? Yes, you do. Yeah. So the mud busting, they have to, they have to wear them, and I'm not saying that you need. Yeah, some of the right. Did you see helmets 20, 30 years ago at rodeos? No, because if you wore a helmet, you were a wimp, right? Yeah, 4-H. Yeah, 4-H. Uh, bikes and yeah, or horses. So they're they're a good idea. They protect the. You know your, your brain bucket. You want to have that have that protected. So you use those when you can. Use those when it makes sense. Gloves to prevent the number one injury that we see at workers' comp fund, which is hand injuries, specifically a cut. That's the number one injury we see. We're all the time cutting our hands. What are some of the th the areas where we would want people wearing gloves at the fair or before the fair? Working with lumber, setting up the pants, anything sharp, and you want to have them in gloves. How much do good gloves cost? They're cheaper than a finger. Much cheaper than a finger. You know, you can get a nice pair of leather gloves for ten bucks. What's the minimum that the minimum medical bill that you're going to see from three or four stitches? Three or four hundred dollars. So you know, three hundred dollars. That that's thirty pairs of of gloves right there. Other PPE as, as appropriate or as needed. Let's talk about some common injury types that, that we see. Strains and sprains from overexertion. There's no way to engineer out all the lifting, twisting, pushing, pulling that you have to do. Setting up hands, setting up displays. And so what can we do to reduce those injuries? Should we provide training on proper lifting techniques? Should we make sure that our volunteers don't think they they need to be super mad? Well, I should get some help, but you know what? I, I lift weights in high school. I can lift this by myself. No, we need to use team lifting, uh, lifting aids if we can, put it on a cart, put it on a dolly when we do the lifting. That's much better than you know trying to, to manually lift everything. Stretching is a great, great thing to do. Stretching to prevent injuries, warms up the muscles, warms up the tendons, the ligaments, makes them more flexible. Slips, trips, and falls are another big one. And those are kind of two types. One is slips and falls, slips, trips, falls on the same level, and the other is from elevation. What can we do to avoid those slips, trips, falls on the same level? Sure, sure we can. They trip over their own feet. What do you they, do? They do. And you know what? It, that, uh, when I was at the, at the Metals Plaza, we had a, a lady that had tripped on the pavement out in, uh, in front of the bleachers. And I had to go do a, an accident investigation. And I went with, she was at the, went to, with the ambulance to the emergency room and ended up with a broken ankle. And I went with her husband and I said, show me where she tripped at, and he's like, okay, right there it is, and I was like, where? <laughs> it's, it's level asphalt, okay, so some people can do that, but there's a lot that we can do with housekeeping. There's a lot we can do getting, and I talked about electrical cords, other clutter, it has a tendency, unless we pick it up, for pallets, litter, boxes, you know, to be left there on, on the floor. We need to get those picked up to avoid the, the trip or, or slip hazards. How about falls from elevation? Safety harness. Okay. 
What, what is the OSHA rule if you are doing, um, by, by the way, the pre-construction that happens, the temporary construction that happens on that build-up to the fair, that generally falls under OSHA's construction standard. What is the height where we need to worry about fall protection? Letter of the law OSHA. I heard it. Six feet. Six feet. Okay. Now, of course, we don't want people to have a five and a half foot fall either. But at, at six feet, if you have a ledge or a working platform that that your employees, volunteers are on, it needs to have guardrail around that. That's the best way to avoid a fall through an engineering control. If somebody has to get up, and I don't know, there there's several different scenarios, but it has to get up higher than six feet, working on something, climbing on something, they should have a full body harness with a shock absorbing lanyard tied off to a secure attachment point, not tied off to the fire sprinkler, not tied off to the venting or the, the HVAC ducting, tied off to a, it's actually got a, your attachment point has to be able to support 5,000 pounds. So it's got to be a pretty secure attachment there. But, but that's to avoid falls from elevation. It doesn't happen all the time, all that often, but when it does, they're usually the broken bones injuries that we see. It doesn't take much of a fall to cause a serious injury. Animal handling, we talked a little bit about this one, you know, training, using the right equipment for the job. And I, so I, with, with my job, I went out and, uh, you know, again, getting back to the OSHA cowboy, I, I went out to a couple of big, branches in the state of Utah. And what do you think their biggest injuries are? With the animals, getting bucked off the horse, getting, you know, a cow kicks them. Or they're often animal related. And I had one of the ranch managers that said, well, come on, you mean I've got to have a training meeting and tell them how to ride horses? Yeah, yeah, you do. You need to have a training meeting and tell them, you know, here's what we need to do to prevent injuries. Now, you don't need to make them wear all the the OSHA cowboy stuff, or the OSHA bull ride, but you do need to train your employees on what the hazards are. Working with animals, don't assume that they come to you fully trained. Cuts, number one injury that we're gonna see, there's so many sharp things out there that can cut our hands, working with lumber, working with putting up temporary bleachers, fencing. Uh, <coughs> provide gloves when you can, when it makes sense if they're working with anything that cause, can cause a hand laceration. I put this one in here, heat-related disorders, because this is another one that we see with your volunteers, with your employees. Most of them are working long hours. Most of your fairs are in the summertime when it might be 100 degrees outside. Give them training on you know, heat stress. What are the signs and symptoms? And have water readily available whenever they want it. That's not only a, an OSHA requirement, but it's a common sense to have plenty of fresh, cool drinking water available. Motor vehicle. You probably all have a motor vehicle policy that applies to driving or operating equipment. <coughs> uh, does it apply to your fares? Of course it applies when they're going down the interstate, but does it apply to your to your parents? Do you allow texting while driving the four wheeler? So I was out at a uh, at a Hill Air Force Base doing a safety inspection for one of my construction policies. And I saw a guy, he was operating a boom lift, and in the boom with him, in the in the bucket, was a guy holding up some sheet metal that he was going to put in place and hand to the guy who was right on the edge of the roof in his, in his fall protection harness. And the guy was operating the control and doing this with his cell phone. <laughs> was operating. So needless to say, we, we made that a strong recommendation not to do that. But they had a, a texting policy in place. I guess no one had told him that you know it, it did apply to operating heavy equipment. <laughs> texting is getting to be a big thing now, you know, not just, not just driving, but it, it really is a, a distraction. You have a seatbelt policy. 
motor vehicles. The other thing that I have seen quite a bit is, you know, more than one rider on the ATV. Or everybody just jumps in the back of the pickup. And, and you know, that's not, everybody should have a, a safety belt. When it comes to hand and power tools, using the right tool for the job and wearing appropriate <coughs> PPE. Special areas of attention. Security and emergencies. What are your procedures? Do you have an emergency action plan for the fair, for the rodeo? Do you have adequate training for your volunteers, for your workers? How about important contacts? When, when somebody says, hey, we have an emergency here, do they have to, you know, is it always called 911 or do you have other procedures? Hey, call this number. Who's, who are the key contact persons? Those should be available on a list somewhere and employees should be trained what to do and where to go in the event of an emergency. Um, I'm, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this because Johnny covered it, but volunteers, they are covered by workers' comp if they are on this designated volunteer list. But what we don't want happening is you have someone who's helping you out and they have their friend or their cousin, they get injured and say, oh, well, yeah, I was, I was asked to help, therefore I'm kind of a volunteer and I kind of should be covered, you know. No, not unless they're on the designated list. You want to keep a designated list? Make sure everybody on that list is trained, just like you would with your new, new hires. Working with youth, okay? Um, so, my boy had his chickens in the fair, and before the fair, when he got the little chicks, he wanted to make a chicken coop, okay? So, Dad, I'm gonna use the saw, he's about 14. Okay, use the saw, be careful, wear your safety glasses. You know, I told him, uh, oh, by the way, I got a new staple, 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 or staple gun that you can use. And, uh, okay, where is it? Went out, and a little bit while later, he came in the house, and he, he wasn't too happy. So, this stapler right here, where did the staples come out? They come out here or here? They come out here. It's a little bit different. So, he was going along, and he, he wanted to get this one, and he's holding it right next to with his hand right here, okay, and he squeezed the trigger and put a staple right there in the palm of his hand. Now, who do you blame for that injury? My wife blamed me too. Uh, I should be held harmless because sitting right under the staple, I had just got this very stapler here, it had the owner's manual on it. It told him how to use it. He should have read that owner's manual. <laughs> Just like every 17, 16, 17, 18 year old is going to do a trip there, right? They're always going to be touched. And the other thing is, it says right here, it's got an arrow, and it's got a little staple here. That means the staple comes off this end. But it is different than, than normal. It's a challenge working with you. Okay, I, I'm on the, uh, there's a national committee the State Committee, Safety for Agriculture and Youth. I'm on that committee. It's chaired by Michael uh, Pate at the USU. He's a professor in the Agriculture Department there. But it, it's a challenge working with youth. They are happy to be there. They're happy to be employed. They don't always, well, they're not adults. Their brain, even 18-year-olds, their brain has not matured until they're in their 20s into a mature brain. They take chances. They don't want to ask questions. So be particularly careful working with youth. And you're going to have a lot of them. Don't rely on common sense. Don't rely on anything they tell you as far as how experienced they are. Non-routine tasks. We need to pay attention to non-routine tasks. Now, what do I mean by a non-routine task? How does that relate to the ferry? How does that relate to the rodeo? We find a lot of times our fatalities at workers' comp fund come from a non-routine task. Somebody doing something just a little bit different. Dave, you had a comment. I was going to throw out some examples. Just everything. You do the fair once a year. 
There's a lot of non-routine tasks. Almost everything with the fair is a non-routine task. And, and maybe it's, maybe the things you do every year are the same, but what if you do something different? Maybe we haven't had fireworks and this year. You know what? The public said, I think they would like fireworks. Let's have, have fireworks. Maybe you have a different type of animal. Maybe instead of cows, you have buffalo. Okay. One of the trucking companies several years ago that I used to go out and visit the, had a very experienced truck driver. Part of his job was loading and unloading, whether it was cattle or, or sheep. They did a good job, never got injured. They had a load to be taken to a Wild West show of buffalo. Got the buffalo loaded appropriately. Now buffalo, they have horns, they have hooves, they're just like cows, right? When the buffalo were being unloaded, they busted out of that trailer and trampled it. Claim was over $100,000. He got ran over by, by the buffalo and uh, caused some serious injuries. It was a non-routine task. Okay? He didn't have the right equipment, maybe the right help, maybe they needed more people to unload those buffalo like, like you should have. So whatever those non-routine tasks are, just keep in mind if we're doing something, a change, we're doing something different, then we need to take extra precaution because that does cause a lot of different injuries. Temporary construction. We, we often have a temporary buildup. It's fast paced. Be, be careful during that time because employees and volunteers are more likely to be injured during that time. Okay? Working with animals, you know, maybe you're going to have elephants this year for the, what? Maybe for the first time you're going to work with an animal that you haven't worked with before. should be promptly investigated and by that I mean an incident form that you have them sign and date here's what happened to me do that for everything a minor laceration they go to the first aid kit they put a band-aid on it still have them fill out that incident form why you never know you never know I've, I've seen those that turn into an infection turn into a workers comp claim and you want to investigate everything. And other, the other reason is, well, what went wrong? Next time it might not be a minor cut. What were you doing and what can we do to prevent that minor accident that could have caused a serious accident? Designate a preferred medical provider. This should all be done beforehand. Accompany that injured employee to the clinic. Now, I know you're busy. Those of you who are uh, work with the fair, the fair managers, they're extremely busy during that time. You mean I gotta take time out of my day? Everybody's calling me and I've got to run that employee to the clinic. Why would we ask that you do that? Make sure why should you accompany the employee? And th this is the case, you know, twelve months out of the year, but why do we do that? Why do we accompany the injured employee? Make sure they get there. Somebody. Shows concern. Somebody said something? Make sure they get there. Make sure they get there. Make sure they go to the right place. If you have a drug policy that they're subject to, make sure they do not stop at their home on the way to the clinic to get their brother or sister's urine specimen. Um, you, and, and that's a big thing. You may think, well, it's just a minor, we got the bleeding stop, take yourself, they may pass out on the way. And then what does that do? Opens up your, your liability, right? It also shows concern. You don't have a right to go in the exam room with them, but you have a right to know what's the diagnosis. Was the bone broken? Was it, did you get stitches? And uh, are there any restrictions? Is there any medication? 
that would preclude you from operating that forklift or from driving, you have a right to know that. Work closely with your claims adjuster, reporting delays increase costs. If you have a fatality or serious injury to an employee, okay, not to the public, but to an employee, that needs to be reported to Utah OSHA within eight hours. If it's on a, a weekend, then uh, leave a message on their voicemail. What about an injury to a volunteer, or I mean a fatality? Okay, fatality to a volunteer, I would say yes, it, it applies. And they're going to want to speak with whoever's in charge and find out what happened. And also serious injuries. I don't have the whole list, but if you have a major broken bone, you have an amputation, you have a concussion, loss of consciousness, all those things need to be reported to Utah OSHA. And you're subject to a citation if you don't. Okay, and they find out about it after the fact. Um, so make sure that you call them if it's a Saturday, Sunday, leave a message and be expecting them to come visit you at their earliest opportunity in the case of a real serious injury or a fatality. If it's a broken ball and you say, well, he slipped and fell, well, have you cleaned it up? Yeah, they, they may or may not come out to do it. A lot of people don't realize that. Report any suspected fraud, follow any work restrictions from that employee. If the doctor says, well, you can't go back to any lifting over 20 pounds, find something for them to do where they, you can follow those restrictions. Don't just say, well, you know, you were hired to put up these sheet pens and if, if you can't do that, then you might as well just stay home. You know, that's going to make that a lost time claim. It's going to make your premium go up and it's, uh, it's a, not a good situation. You want to accommodate those restrictions. And there's always something they can do, busy work. There's something you can have them do at the fair. Off of modified duty. Lastly, it's a good idea, and I know I, I do this as, as their safety rep with Davis County, a pre-event safety survey. Before the fair, a week or so before the fair, we will go through and look at the housekeeping. Look at the walking and working areas. Look at the high traffic areas, the electrical, the bleachers, the barriers and signage, um, making sure those areas that are supposed to be off limits to the public are indeed signed and, and uh, barriers put up and, and uh, tape and that type of thing to keep the public out of those. The last slide and the last question for the day, and this is your homework assignment. Okay. What is your biggest concern at your fair, at your event that, that you are over? What is your biggest safety concern? What keeps you up at night worrying about this? And what are your current controls that you have as far as engineering, administrative, or personal protective equipment? Are those adequate? Or is there something that this year you need to do a little bit differently? Okay, so write that down, get back with Johnny. No, just kidding. You don't, you don't have to turn in your quiz. Um, that's everything that I have. Does anyone have any questions?